All righty. Uh, welcome, Joe. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Um, what we're going to be doing today, we're going to be uh, employing your expertise of, Canadian, of oil and gas marketing to be able to discuss the movement and the flow uh, of Canadian crude. Uh, you've, we've got some material prepared here to share with everybody, uh, for anybody that, uh, uh, that, that wants to be able to follow through the visuals. Uh, there's a pin, pin link uh, on, my, um, on my profile. You'll be, able to, you'll be able to go there and then you'll be able to follow the map that Joe will later uh, share with us. Uh, but for now, uh, let's uh, begin with maybe just a slight or a brief introduction uh, for the folks that don't know you, but uh, by now, a lot of people know you as the refinery guy, just through your participation in the spaces and uh, everything you've been able to, all the insights you've been able to share with us and um, provide. Uh, so, uh, Joe, it's lovely to have you join us. Uh, maybe a couple of words, a little, maybe a, a little about you, uh, and then we'll begin with uh, the material we have at hand. Sounds good. So, Abe, uh, thanks for inviting me to do this. I've uh, really enjoyed it over the last uh, year and a half uh, doing the spaces with uh, the Calm Group and other folks and interacting, and it's been uh, it's been great. So from from a background perspective, I uh, I grew up in Lloydminster, so I was always involved in heavy oil, and um, um, ended up um, working for a number of companies in the early part of my career, and then the last 25 years, I was involved in the crude supply and trading business. Um, uh, sending crude oil to refineries um, <clears throat> and uh, and that was a wonderful experience and uh, it was um, something I totally loved it, doing and enjoyed it a lot and and it was there where I really got to understand uh, the crude oil market and and every day was a new experience and journey something to to work on and, and solve um, from a problem or issue standpoint and and just getting just getting the crew to your <clears throat> to your refineries but that's where i understood or i got to learn about the market crude market the canadian market the u.s market the world markets and all that type stuff so um as we you know i retired a year and a half ago two years ago um it's been a great journey um on this side now which is you know investing in our oil and gas companies and trying to parlay the knowledge I have of the market to some of our friends in the community. And, and now I'm thinking about, uh, that's why we're doing this, this spaces is, is essentially to, um, provide some more insight, I think. And, and, uh, the tip of the iceberg about how does the physical market work? How does, you know, oil flow? How does, you know, where does it go? What pipelines, uh, the disposition, um, how, how does pricing determine, for example, how does that all work? And I'm going to try to keep it at a pretty high level. Um, but, but um, you know, obviously, if anybody has any questions and they need to reach out to me, they certainly can. At Joe Beats 11 is my <clears throat> uh, Twitter handle if they want to send me a DM or any of that type of thing. So, uh, yeah, any um, that's uh, that's a good for, for the beginning, I think. And uh, um, I'll let you uh, take it away from there. So, hey. Uh, Joe, uh, when when we were sort of prepping for this um, and we were kind of coming up with an outline of sort of what to discuss and what's going to be prevalent, I think the central theme uh, or the conclusion right before we end it, um, you asked me the question is, well, uh, what is a barrel of crude worth to you, right? What is, what is, and then and, and I remember telling you, I remember thinking about it and I'm like, you know what, that's, that's a great way to start off the discussion um, by, by asking the question. Uh, what is a barrel of crude worth to you or anyone for that matter? And that's essentially where you kind of begin um, thinking about, um, okay, so what value are you going to place to that? And how are you going to determine the value? And what is it needed um, for the everyday consumer? So right. uh, you asked me that question. I'm going to ask it right back to you to start us off. Joe, you know, <laughs> what is a barrel of crude worth to you? <laughs> Well, the, the the NYMEX screen would tell us today that a barrel of WTI has $80 of value. But what does that mean is is the value of crude oil? If I gave you, a, as you said, a, a, a barrel of crude oil, um, obviously in liquid form, what is it worth to you? Well, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> and you'd be like, well, maybe I can you know, hang on to it. But the reality and the reason for the question is um, a barrel of crude oil um, is worth 
uh, the value of that barrel processed at a refinery and turned into transportation fuels, uh, asphalt, uh, all the you know petrochemicals, all that type stuff that can come out of a barrel of crude oil. Um, crude oil by itself is just a you know it's just a barrel, <laughs> and so it's the processing of of the barrel that makes it uh, valuable, and then then and then turning into transportation fuels for for what society needs to to move around gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, um, and and other type things, asphalt for your roads, your pavement for your uh, for your uh, parking lots and and, the, and roofing, etc. Plus all the light ends that uh, get made into plastics and other things that we use in our everyday life. And so that barrel of crude oil is is worth a lot if if properly processed and and moved uh, to the right uh, to the right markets. So um, it is an interesting question because when you think about it, what would I do with it? Um, well, that that's that's just yourself. But you know, if in the system that we have, um, and that's what I want to get talking about is, hey, what is the physical market? How does it work? And 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 we'll go from there. And um, I'll try to incorporate some of the refinery side. I don't. I won't go into big details on on how refineries work and whatnot. I was never my expertise. There's others in the comm space that are much better at doing that. So, but you know, um, so have I, I have this map that I think I will use to help uh, translate, if you will, or help educate folks around. Um, around our market and the Gulf Coast market and et cetera. So I'll, I'll share my screen here. Absolutely. What is the barrel worth uh, to you, Sohaib? <laughs> the end products that it produces. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that was sort of the, the kind of the biggest conclusion and understanding, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the inputs and then the outputs for it um it's it, that's that's essentially where you need to be at yeah yeah and and that whole supply chain is so long you know if you think about bringing a barrel of oil you need to be able to share that so hey the, the supply chain is, is just massive think about you know if you're going to do an oil sands project where you have to start you know you're going to start with um the geology you're going to start with then procuring the land you're going to find your resource base and then you're going to get into the point of making an application then you're going to go you know start um building the asset uh, build it up and and whatnot and then start doing all the other things you needed to produce drill wells etc then you're going to actually bring oil to the ground and then you're going to actually start moving it on pipelines and and then you're going to actually get it to the hub and then send it to the market by pipeline maybe even train maybe even truck, who knows, right? So, um, and then you're going to get it to a refiner who's going to do all the things that they need to do. And then they're going to make clean products. And then that's going to go to the market and to eventually to, uh, to your tank. So if you think about, again, that whole supply chain, it is massive, right? So um, we're only going to talk a little bit about the front side of that <clears throat> if, um, and, and try to go down that path. So uh, can you see that? Is that yeah. up on the screen? Yeah, so I have it on the screen. And I guess the first order of business is going to be to go through an overview of the Canadian um, physical oil market um, and the high level disposition of, you know, where everything is produced and how everything flows uh, through the system and where it ends up. Uh, and that sort of is going to get us thinking as to the next part of the conversation, which is going to be about pricing and how pricing is established. And that's going to provide a little more clarity about the Western Canadian Select and and uh, how that pricing is the differential and how that pricing is is, is sort of set. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's go. So, uh, can you see this here? I got the their little red uh, laser marker. Um, obviously, this is up here in Western Canada. Primarily, our production area is. Alberta, a little bit into BC on the crude oil side, some into Saskatchewan and a little bit into uh, Manitoba down in this area here. So that is what we call the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin. Uh, today, I don't have the exact number, but it's over 5 million barrels a day of production out of this basin. Um, and, and if I think about how many different grades of crude oil that we have, in this basin, it's well over 40, might even be 50 grades of 
of crude oil. So when I say grades of crude oil, what am I talking about? I'm talking about, well, um, there are some very light condensates in this market. Uh, there's some mixed sweet crude grades. There's some light sour crude grades that get produced down in this region. Uh, there's also some heavy oil, some conventional heavy oil that gets produced in around the Lloydminster area here. You can see there's some heavy oil sands area, and that's our biggest production that we have. Uh, and there's multiple ways of, of which we produce that heavy oil, starting with Coal Lake just north of just over here and then uh, up into the oil sands with their SAG D steam assisted say, uh, gravity drainage. And then there are some in the Fort Mac, Fort McMurray region, there's some big mines uh, that have uh, upgraders attached to them that produce synthetic crude oil. And then we also have uh, crude that are paraffinic froth treated, which is a mine that goes, takes the, the bitumen from the oil sands and then processes it through a process and then sends that uh, that blend to market. So uh, all in, uh, 5 million barrels a day of Western Canadian production. And uh, it's a fantastic feat to see, uh, to see that uh, we produce that much on a daily basis. And I don't know where we stand in the, in the world. We've got to be number three or four, I would think. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's outstanding. So, um, from there, I, I think about the disposition or whatnot. So the, the producers are, are the ones that, you know, from the producing regions need to get that oil down into the hubs. And the hubs are Edmonton, Hardesty, and then you have some in Carabert, Regina, and Cromer on, on, on the Enbridge pipeline system here. So the, the purpose and, and key point about the hubs here is the two, two biggest ones are really Edmonton and Hardesty. And that's where the big trunk lines exist to export our, our oil from, from Western Canada to the marketplace. So um, from a very super high level standpoint, you know, the 5 million barrels of oil, well, where do they go? Well, let's just go west to east. And, and, and that will probably be the is, easiest way to do that. So... Um, you have a pipeline called Trans Mountain that flows barrels over to the west coast, a place called Burnaby, and, and that pipeline there is a multi-commodity pipeline moving gasoline. It also moves distillate. It also moves crude oil uh, over there, and it moves crude also into uh, Washington State, so where there are some refineries sitting right over here. So um, the market is going through uh, an expansion on the uh, Trans Mountain pipeline. We hope that comes on latter part of or sometime in 24 2024 let's hope it does um extra capacity and egress is fantastic for us uh as a market now um we'll talk about that a little bit later on so uh the major uh markets for our canadian oil are are eastbound and uh primarily there are uh three major trunk systems if you will that move our crude oil and Enbridge Pipeline, which is this red line here that I'm following, goes all the way into Chicago area here. It goes up into the Sarnia uh, area here, and it keeps flowing south uh, all the way down if you keep following the Enbridge system uh, through Cushing down here. So from Chicago down to Cushing and then down into the U.S. Gulf Coast. Um, it is a big system. When I go back into this line in this segment here, it looks on this map, and by the way, we're using the CAP map, uh, Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. They produce a map every year. You go on the web page, and it is uh, by far the best uh, um, information in terms of uh, pipelines, you know, high-level production um, areas, if you will, the refineries and their and their uh, refining capacity by the different. Uh, uh, locations that they are. So it's it's a great, uh, great map. And uh, the folks there at CAP do a great job with uh, putting this out. Um, so the Ambridge system here, as I was talking about, so had multiple lines. Like there's four or five pipelines that go all the way down the system. So it's just not one line. So there's some, you know, two lines that are moving heavy crude. There's some lines that are moving just light crudes. And there's lines that are moving um, the last line that uh, the, the system built was line three and that replacement and that moves both light and heavy crude on the same system. So um, that's uh, 
that's the Enbridge. Um, the other big system that happens uh, that we move crude on, and I say we a lot, we only just because I've been part of industry for so many years in my life. I just, uh, I just think of it as, uh, as we, the industry. So uh, this, the industry moves crude on Keystone, which is this pipeline hot here. So from Hardesty down south and then across and then down here again, uh, one, one tranche here goes over to the St. Louis Wood River market, the next tranche down into the Cushing market. And then uh, the folks at TransCanada have another system that's called uh, Market Link, I believe, that just, uh, there it is there, that goes all the way down into the Gulf Coast. So that's another system that moves crude. And then um, uh, I used to think that there was a capacity here on the side, but it's not. So that's okay um, uh, for the pipelines. But, uh, and the last uh, other, Big system, if you will, is Express. I guess it's owned now by Enbridge, but it goes down into the in the Pad Four Rockies region, and then there's another pipeline that goes all the way across over to the into the Wood River St. Louis market as well. So those are those are the the main, main um, disposition pipelines, if you will, to get crude from from Western Canada to the market. Um, once you know, once you get over here on this segment. The barrels will go all the way over to Montreal uh, on on the line nine segment from Sarnia across. Um, they will, you know, reach into D Detroit. They'll go down into Chicago. They go down in Chicago here, down into St. Louis. They go into the Ohio Valley. Um, they reach obviously into the Cushing and and Central Midwest America here, and they also go down into the U.S. Gulf Coast. Um, and we've talked about that in the past where the U S Gulf coast has a, a lot of heavy oil refining capacity. So, you know, the majority of the crude oil that we do produce here in Western Canada is the heavy oil variety. And of course, having the U S Gulf coast who, you know, has a heavy oil refining configuration, it's a perfect match that a lot of our crude oil that we send down either the Keystone and or the Amber system ends up in the Gulf coast. Uh, down down here so and it's right across the board where it goes in so anyway so hey that's you know a very super high 30,000 foot uh, description of the dispositions is there any questions that you have yeah so the key uh, export markets for Canadian oil um, so you talked you highlighted a couple of the different um, points but if we can just maybe talk like specifically um, which ones uh, are the major ones that will that will take the crude? Yeah, um, well, think about it like this. So, <clears throat> um, refineries are close to high population centers, and there's a reason for that because we're making refiners are making transportation fuel. So, if you're going to be close to where people are driving and 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 moving around, you want to have your refineries close to there. So. Um, some of the major regions that our Canadian crude oil goes, uh, Chicago is one of the main markets. There's a, another market here in, in Minnesota, obviously, uh, with there's, uh, they got Chicago, then you have, uh, Canadian crude over in the Toronto Sarnia area, the Michigan Detroit region. So this is kind of like, if I, if you will, just one region per se, um, St. Louis over here, uh, it's another region. I, we talk about that here on the map as Wood River. Uh, that's the location where I think Sonova's it is has their refinery, and and so um, that this region here is is another area. Um, Ohio Valley, another tranche, and that's where um, company I think Marathon has a few refineries over there, includes and also Sonova's with their Lima refinery. And then uh, in and around Cushing, uh, Oklahoma, um, which is, you know, the location for um, where the NYMEX WTI contract uh, can be settled for a ex physical barrel, um, that's here. But there's also a whole bunch of other uh, refineries around that region, um, and, and they get crude from from wherever they're uh, and sent across. And, but the big center is down here on the Gulf Coast, and that's where the majority of the refining so from a very super high level um, when i think about refining capacities this whole thing called pad two and pads are i can't remember the name of it but it's sort of like something defense district and pad two is considered the upper midwest and that's like a 3.8 million barrel a day refining area so you know 
you would have it there, 3.8. Down here in the Gulf Coast, I don't have the exact number memorized, but it's it's in the 9 million barrels a day of refining capacity. So when when they're all up and running, you'll have, that's, that's a lot of refining capacity. This thing, pad one here is on the East Coast, and that, that'll be just a little over a million barrels, I believe. Um, pad four, um, in my head, 550 to 600, I think. Uh, 1,000 barrels a day refining capacity. And you can see if you added all these up, you would get the number. And then in the pad five, which is mainly California down here, and then a little bit up here in Washington state are the locations of the, of the West coast refineries. So though there, there are a little bit of barrels from Canada that get into here. And then when we talk about TMX, we'll talk about the potential for more barrels to get into this market down here into, uh, into, into California. But so those are the main, so for the Western Canadian barrel, uh, think about how it flows and think about the population centers. So Chicago, Tor uh, Toronto, Detroit, uh, over here, uh, St. Louis, a little bit of Minneapolis, and then down into the Gulf Coast uh, as, as the major, major markets for the crude. And one of the things that really struck me, Joe, when we were talking about how um, the, the, the crude gets priced, um, uh, it's byproduct of uh, uh, the access that refineries can have to them, one thing that really st struck uh, me was the flow of Canadian crude and how it moves now relative historically mm. uh, and how the increase, how we, we were at 1.5 million barrels and how the increase of uh, our production has shifted the entire. So can we just touch a little point about how crude um, was was flowing previous to the increase and then try and then um, the other point was the convergence where prior and um, WTI was always higher than Brent. Okay. And then as American production increased, um, uh, Brent is now higher than WTI. Uh, so if we can touch on those two points, Joe. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, before I answer the first question, we, you talked about, um, you know, U.S. shale. So, and I haven't touched on it yet because I've been talking about Canadian, but uh, U.S. shale, so uh, the Permian, uh, area down in in this region here hopefully everyone can see and then uh eagleford in and around the corpus area over in here and then the other shale play is the uh, uh bakken play which is up up in here there's a little play over here in niobrara uh down in here somewhere i believe it is and there's some some production that's being pursued down here in this area as well but um uh, as, as we all know, the U.S. Uh, production is 12.2 12, 12 million barrels or 12.3 million barrels on Wednesday per their stats. And, and there's also some up in Alaska. But when we talk about U.S. production, that's uh, the shale oil is, is the primary. Uh, in around Cushing is the old, uh, older uh, conventional WTI, era, uh, WTI barrels. So, but to your, to your question is, um, you know, I, I said... Initially, at the beginning of this discussion, that you know, Western Canada is producing five million barrels. So it, it always wasn't five million barrels. Obviously, um, there was a time when this area up here, and I remember when I started uh, my career in this in the market side, um, that production would have been two million, maybe two and a half million barrels, um, maybe even less than that. And and so the implication of that production at that level was um we would send crude oil to market and we would send it as far as uh chicago maybe a little bit down into the st louis market that i talked about maybe a little bit in ohio valley but <clears throat> there wasn't sufficient enough canadian oil to fill all the refinery capacity so that the refineries could make uh clean products for the local transportation fuel demand and so what ended up happening was uh, crude oil from the Gulf Coast and Cushing would come up into Chicago or come up into Detroit and Toledo, the Ohio Valley. And, and so uh, how would that happen? Well, when I looked at, um, when you look at this map, uh, a lot of the pipeline flows that today are going southbound, back in those days, they were northbound flowing crude oil. 
So for example here, the latest line that moved um, to go southbound was cap line last year, and that's over here. Well, that used to be a major flow from New Orleans, if you will, and flowed crude oil from the Gulf Coast that, that we would bring in by ship and, and flow it north and go into this market and then all the way up to uh, into Chicago. And uh, there were other systems that originally we, we talked about. I talked about the Seaway pipeline that moves from Cushing to the Gulf Coast. It, uh, in the older days, it, it would actually flow crude northbound into the Cushing market. And in fact, in, in the older days, uh, and this is what you're talking about, um, in the summertime, that's when the United States would actually increase the demand for driving, obviously, because as people get out and about, well, and we didn't have enough crude oil to satisfy the refining demand. So we would bring in crude oil from the world and it would come up Seaway into Cushing and then up to the markets that we just talked about. Well, in order for that to happen economically, the price of WTI would be higher than the price of Brent crude or North America, uh, Northwest European crude or African crude, such that that economic arbitrage would occur and, and crude would come into us uh, in, in the summer summertime, primarily when uh, when the refiners uh, in the northern tier or Midwest were increasing their run rates to uh, to satisfy um, the runs. Now, the other thing that happens is there are pipelines that move clean products from the Gulf Coast northbound. Um, but uh, in the in the in the days that I remember, you know, older days, uh, we would have crude coming into the market here. You'd have other crude coming up northbound, and and it would compete for um, the refining capacity. And then as as our and I, I'd say this as the engineers and folks like Razor Oil would figure out how to produce the oil sands and and especially the SAG D and and other types of crude um, uh, technologies to bring oil sands out of the ground. We found the ability to go from that two and a half million barrels to the five million barrels we're talking today that I just mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Well, in order for us to get to that five million barrels, we had the market had to change the flow. Um, and what what happened was a lot of the pipelines that are that were going northbound started to shift south. So it started here with lines like this uh, spearhead that was that started to flow south and then from Cushing southbound uh, Seaway started to move and then when TransCanada did all their pipeline system then they built another segment and then I think Seaway was twinned uh, and then it, you know, as I said it ultimately ended up with uh, Capline last year uh, flowing southbound and and now you're you're sitting in a situation where uh, all the refining capacity needs uh, over here are met with uh, the crude that comes from the Bakken and Canada down. And there's some some crude over here in the Ohio Valley, which comes across this Mid Valley pipeline. It can come all the way across, uh, but the majority of the crude oil is uh, is uh, is all or the refineries are all are met with uh, Canadian and then and the Bakken crude oil. So now, Joe, as a follow up to that, um, if we can discuss now how refiners source their crude and how you know that decision is made because though that decision ultimately affects the price of oil so if we can talk about how based on uh, the access of what they have they can determine maybe what type of oil they would like or how what different um, types of oils and how they get priced based on the demand for them by the refiners yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do my best and keep it very super high level. Um, so earlier in the talk, I said that there were 50 different grades of crude oil that, that are up here. Um, and, and the barrel of light crude is that we have light sweet, we call it mixed sweet oil, is very similar to the barrel of WTI. So they're very much look alike crudes. And, and, and so um, that's great. Um, the... The majority of our crude that we produce is a heavy oil, right? And uh, that heavy oil, we know about WCS. <clears throat> WCS is like the marker grade. And uh, and and it, it prices, though, at a discount to the WTI barrel or even to the mixed sweet barrel. Um, why is it a price at a discount? 
Well, it price that discount because if you were to just simply boil that crude and make the resultant gasoline and distillate and, and jet fuel and asphalt that come out of that barrel, the gross product worth of a heavy barrel is worth is, is less dollar wise than the gross product worth of just simply boiling a barrel of WTI and making its resultant gasoline and distillate and jet fuel and, and asphalt. The reason being is um, the lighter barrels will typically make more high value transportation fuels like the gasoline and distillate. Uh, whereas the heavier barrels, uh, they make more uh, resid or asphalt and those barrels typically are, are worth less than the gasoline and distillate. So, so the first thing being um, crude oil quality um, affects the price uh, of the barrel that uh, you produce based on the quality of that said crude. Now, as a, as a market per se and, and a super high level, um, our Canadian barrels up here uh, are exporting out of this region to, to the marketplace. And the barrels in Canada basically all price off the U.S. Gulf Coast crudes. So the WCS on the Gulf Coast uh, would, is actively traded. And it's uh, and and the price therefore then of the uh, WCS up in Hardesty is essentially Gulf Coast WCS less some transportation that gets you back into the Hardesty pricing, and um, and and that pricing is a function of or that transportation is a function of all well, the tariffs that it, it costs you to move from that Hardesty location down. Similarly, the light barrel uh, crude oil, uh, as it's clearing into the market, you know, uh, the alternative is the Gulf Coast crudes or the crudes over here in Cushing and the crudes that might come across. Uh, there is a line here called Lozark that can come in here. And so you have light barrels competing uh, right in that region. And, and so those barrels would set the price based on the price or light crude against the barrel out of Cushing. So as a refiner, you have the ability to see all these crudes coming down the system. And there's heavy crudes, the light crudes, the light sour crudes, there's synthetic crude oil, uh, et cetera. So uh, as a refiner, you're just looking at the different various grades, the basis differentials of each of the grades. And then relative to the refiner's configuration, he's trying to, he or she's trying to figure out, okay, what is the best combination of crude oils can I put together into my slate that generates the optimal uh, dollar uh, as an output into uh, transportation fuels and asphalt and all the other components that a barrel of crude oil produces. Uh, and so that's all part of the the, the game that I call it a game that, that's being played around uh, buying the rate slate for your for your refineries. So does that, does that get some of your question? It does. And then um, when, when we talk about um, how the pricing is set. You talked about how that pricing is set, um, but we want to talk about um, how, when when it, so when sometimes you end up with getting bottlenecking and then mm -hmm. the price ends up dipping and, and so forth. If you could talk about maybe some yeah. of the areas that typically cause the congestion um, that cause these prices to fall out. Yeah, yeah. So this is all back up in here. So um, there have been occurrences in time where a barrel of Canadian oil has insufficient pipe egress to get to market. And in those circumstances, um, what that means is total barrels being produced is greater than the total pipeline capacity out of our basin. And therefore, what that means is we have barrels that can't get to market. And what ends up happening is the barrels that cannot get to market then try to be solved um, into what solution space do they have? Well, the first solution space is they try to get stored, right? You store into tanks. And so um, those barrels that can't get into market or into the pipelines, you know, they're knocking on the door of the guy that owns the tanks and saying, Hey, can I, can I rent a room here for the month? And, and, and so that'll go on. And, 
and the other alternative that happens when you can't uh or when you can't get into the pipes is you find alternate means of getting your crude out and that's that's something like crude by rail you know um crude by rail we had built it we the assist the industry had built it up at one point in time uh i can't remember the actual year but it was over 300,000 barrels a day of crude by rail that was being moved out uh, of our region uh, to the market. You know, in the early days and when uh, the Bakken boom, when they really figured out how to bring that, uh, the crude, on, crude oil uh, of shale out of the, to the market, there was insufficient pipe capacity for those barrels to move to market. And, and then there were almost a million barrels a day of Bakken crude that was getting railed to the East Coast. You know, and 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 some of Canada, and and so rail becomes uh, a solution for the barrels that can't move when you have egress issues. Now, um, you know, some of the largest uh, discounts on the Canadian barrels occur when you have filled all the tank space that I talked about, the the solution space, and and production is still high. And, and what ends up happening is the discount on the, um, the grades, the differentials, they continue to weaken to the point where it just is not economic anymore for producers to produce and they start shutting in barrels. And, um, you know, it's always a tough part and, and tough scene when that happens, but it's the egress that and, and storage becoming full and no alternate ways of getting crewed out, crewed by rail, if that's all full, that's what leads to that severe discounting of, of crude basis in, in Western Canada. Joe, could we discuss um, the need for condensate? Um, mm. and how, you know, in different markets, condensate is more, um, um, what is it, uh, valuable than others and, and why so? Okay. Um, so... As I said, you know, the crude in Western Canada are, are all being exported out and, and to the Gulf Coast. And so we're a Gulf Coast less transportation uh, as a price setting mechanism for our grades. Condensate is, is different in that the marginal barrel of condensate is actually imported into this region. And, and why is that? Well, the demand for the condensate is from the heavy producers that are, that are up here in this in the heavy oil region. They need to blend condensate to um, take their raw viscous bitumen uh, and and um, and allow it to run uh, or flow on in the pipeline. So uh, I think Razor and 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 Mark Skittles have talked in the past on on some of our spaces. The condensate. Um, the bitumen when they bring it out of the ground is, is like molasses in your fridge if you try to pour it out it just doesn't flow and so the condensate helps uh the viscosity of that crude oil to flow in the pipeline so the pipelines tell the the market and the participants you know how to um how much they need to blend to get to certain pipeline specs and it typically is highest blending in the uh, winter time because we have uh, cold weather up here and our pipelines get cold and our pipelines are in the ground so we blend more condensate in the winter time and uh and then in the summertime it's less and so what ends up happening is if i can go back to the map here <clears throat> we have two major systems of importing in condensate so from the gulf coast um there's some crude that there are some condensates and they all they, they come from down here in this area, uh, Bo not Beaumont, not Beaumont. Uh, anyway, that start down in the Gulf Coast. Uh, they move their way up north. Uh, they get into, uh, into Chicago and they go on a pipeline called Southern Lights that takes it right back into Edmonton. And um, that's one method uh, of crude coming or condensate coming up. And the other one is from down in this region that comes up on Koshin pipeline and, and then cuts across into uh, into Hardesty and Edmonton as well. Um, those are the two pipelines. So um, our condensate then would be um, starts with the Gulf Coast price because everything starts in the Gulf Coast price. Um, but it's Gulf Coast plus transportation will be the price in Edmonton. Whereas if I'm a barrel of WCS, I'm Gulf Coast less transportation. 
Uh, and so um, the other thing that's going on in our market from a condensate perspective is the Montany play. And uh, over in this region here, Northeast BC, some of the very uh, liquids rich um, Montany gas producers uh, are producing, um, you know, condensate that comes into the market into Edmonton and then sent by the Condi pipelines into the uh, oil sands uh, producing regions. So, so the main difference is Condi is an import market and we're short. So we, the market needs to import in to solve our needs. And then whereas crude that we generate and produce every day, it's an export market. So we export down to the Gulf coast. And that adds to why um, the condensate that's produced in Alberta um, gets a premium to WTI and um, <clears throat> the heavy oil, you know, part of the fact that uh, it's, it's less valuable um, is, is, is um, gets a discount. Yeah, so so that the way I think I've always thought about it is condensate is necessary for the producer, heavy producer, to get his barrel to market. So it's it's a cost of goods sold to him. He needs to, without it, he can't do anything. He's got a barrel of raw bitumen. It's like the question I started at the beginning with you. What's he going to do with this bitumen? Because it's just sitting there in Edmonton, or it's just sitting up at the field gate, or it's just sitting out in his uh, produce tank. So he needs that condensate to monetize that barrel of bitumen. So it's a cost of goods sold, so he needs to go get it. So his you know, his, his guy should be trying to figure out how to reduce his cost of condensate because that would help his net back um, from, a, you know, and then once the guy blends that barrel in to, to his raw bitumen and gets it to pipeline spec, then, and he gets it to a refiner who pay, pay him for it, then he's got some, then he has some value on, on that barrel of bitumen. So now that we discussed that, could we discuss about uh, the the pricing curve and that how that helps guide uh, the decision of uh, an oil marketeer? And I did notice that we did skip the question, what is oil marketing, which is maybe mm. fundamental. Okay. So maybe if we can hit that, you know, what is oil marketing? How does it work? And then we we're going to find we're going to segue our way back into uh, uh, into that pricing curve discussion. Okay. Um, well, crude oil marketing, um, there, there, there are processes and procedures that this whole area, 5 million barrels a day of production, um, that need to follow to, you know, move your barrel, um, from, from the ground, if you will, uh, to market. So it, the, the crude system, uh, we have 30 day cycles. And, um, and what we need to do or what we do do is, uh, we let the pipelines know, um, you know, a month in advance, how much we think we're going to produce oil, produce from our, from our areas. Uh, and then that crude gets, you know, um, eventually sold. So to be even more specific, and, and this is how it works, and I don't want to get too into it. So I'll just kind of stay at 30,000 feet. So, um, in the market, the the way it works is um, we trade the physical crude grade differential uh, a month in advance of the actual production. So let's do it as an example. So um, when we start May 1st, we will start trading the June basis differential. So that means that the WCS differential, the LSB differential, the synthetic differentials, and the 52 grades of ice cream or crude grades that I talked about, we'll start the market, we'll start trading those grades. So on May 1 through uh, essentially May 20, uh, the, the market trades the basis differential of what is expected to be produced because the crude oil marketer has talked to his VP of production and they the VP has said, Hey, look, I think I'm going to have this many barrels to sell in June. And the marketer is out there trying to go sell those barrels. The marketer's job is to try to maximize his net back and also follow the procedures of getting the crudes from the production site through the pipeline systems, following all the system, all the systems and processes that we have, uh, that the market has built over time. Um, so that so that's what happens uh and and why the 20th well um and it's a high level number it's not always the 20th uh 
the 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 system or the the, the market the participants on the 20th need to make a nomination to the trunk lines so to the Embridges and the keystones and the trans mountains that says okay i want to send so many barrels down your pipeline uh that's called a nomination and the carrier turns around in the day or two later and says okay i accept your nomination here's how much pipe space you get or or all that type stuff um and that's called um you know the whole nominating to the to the to the trunk systems and that really then sets how many barrels will be exported out of the basin uh and then in the month of production so now we're talking june 1st uh we know how much crude uh we have on the pipeline systems for the month of june on the on the trunk systems the refiner uh during that time in may was buying his his or her grades that he thinks he needs for his refinery um and and so so now he's nominated that to the pipeline and he knows what's going to come on so now starting on june 1st we start bringing the barrels out of the ground uh for the june throughputs and the price of wti is is the thing that we then price in for each day of business day of june and we already know what the differential is because we already established the differential for most part of our crudes in in the trading system or trading weeks uh in 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 may there or sorry in in may for the june and so what happens every day in june as we produce crude and we have a business day and the nymex settles that determines the wti price of of the crude grade that you're purchasing you already know what the discount is or the differential and at the and on uh june 30th uh after the close on the nymex you would actually know what you're going to pay for your crude because you have settles on every nymex settle for that month of june you have your differential you do the math and you say hey look i owe you this much for your crude and the way the system works is that on the 20th 20th or 25th of the next month you pay there's the exchange between the buyers and the sellers of the crude oil so at the super high level uh, you know the crude marketer on the produ uh, producer side is trying to maximize net back go through the processes that you need to flow crude to the market um there's two sides of the uh, the markets the marketing side. The, the refiners have their crude supply guys who are trying to buy crude uh, for their refineries um, based on what the refinery is ordering to to you know maximize uh, what they can through the refinery, and uh, all that all comes together called uh, called the market, and uh, um, you know it's it's a wonderful thing when you're in it every day, and it's Groundhog Day. Every 30 days you do, get to do it all over again. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and then uh, to touch on crude blending, um, mm -hmm. and um, you know we're looking at some of the the, the EIA adjustments we're getting, and we're noticing uh, partly what's responsible for that. Uh, could we talk about uh, you know if you're blending condensate, that's one thing. Could we talk about the different types of blending that takes place with the higher API uh, oils? Yeah, and and we forgot about the. Uh, um, the basis shape, the, the contango and backwardation. So we gotta do that one too. Um, but first of all, the blending piece of it is that, you know, the blending happens all across the continent and, and you have um, higher priced streams of crude and or intermediates and or clean products uh, and you have lower priced streams. And essentially all blending really is, is taking a lower value stream blending it into a higher value stream and collecting that, that arbitrage, but doing so within the constraints of what the system has been set up. So uh, in terms of the way the physical crude oil is, um, you have a sulfur, you have a density spec, sulfur spec. Um, there's also tan specs, uh, which relates to the acid in the crude and all those type of things. So um, when blending occurs, it is done to try to high grade a low value product into a higher value product, but stay within the confines of the specs of, uh, of what's been established. Um, what's going on down in the Gulf Coast, and we talk about these adjustment factors, is you have some crude grades that are being uh, blended into other streams, so they would be worth less. And, and so they're just trying to find, they, the marketers, whoever it is, are trying to find value 
by blending them into other uh, higher valued streams within the confines of the, the specs of that crude. So, and it just keeps, you know, it keeps, it appears that it keeps getting larger on the Gulf Coast because you have lighter um, Permian or, or, or lighter crudes on the Gulf Coast being produced in the shale. And so the lighter the oil, um, the less value that it has because it doesn't make as much the of the uh, clean products as I was talking about earlier uh, from a simply boiling it a boiling point. So what ends up happening is they try to you know try to move it into other parts uh, or other streams that that may be of higher value. And then to go back to um, that uh, conversation of how uh, the forward curve guides your decision. Uh, as an oil marketeer and how you move your crude. Um, so if we can talk a little about that. Yeah, okay. Um, so so it's really um, the, the crude oil shape is, is uh, when I say the word shape, what I'm talking about is um, the WTI contract. You have your prompt month, you have your second month, you have your third month, and all the way down the strip. It's called the strip of uh, monthly pricing. Uh, if that shape is showing that the prompt month is worth more than the second contract and it's more than the third contract and it's more than the fourth contract, then it's something that we call it's a backward dated market because the market is putting a premium on having uh, supply in their hands and it, typically a backward market indicates a uh, and a, a market that doesn't have, or that, that is shorter on supply. Whereas the alternative is the contangle market. The contangle market is where the front of the curve is pricing cheaper than the second nearby and the cheaper than the third nearby. And, and the reason why it's cheaper is because it's oversupplied. And just like I mentioned, um, when Canada didn't have enough egress capacity, the front month would get cheaper because it would incent store the, the price action of it becoming cheaper in price would allow for somebody to store that barrel and they could go into the forward curve and sell the futures of the forward WTI price and lock in their WTI price. Um, they could also go into the forward curve of the WCS curve or the LSB curve or mixed sweet curve and, and lock up their basis differential and, and essentially um, lock in the storage ARB, if you will, uh, that the market was given you. So for a marketer the, the, or anybody in the marketplace, the shape of the WTI or the, even the shape of the basis differential, the, it's telling you something. If, if the basis differential is for WCS is in a backward dated shape, it's telling you, hey, look, uh, this, this is in short supply because you have a backward dated curve. And that's why, you know, I, I, I like to always look at the forward shape and, and is, is the WTI backward, is the uh, basis differentials backward dated? And if that's a yes, yes, that's usually telling you're in a pretty good situation. Um, similarly, if you're uh, can tango on both, that's telling you we're very well supplied. And, um, and that's uh, probably going to lead to lower prices. Now, one last thing about forward curves that, and, and the forward curve 12 months out or 24 months out, in my opinion, is, um, is not very uh, predicted, uh, predictable of where the future prices are going to be. So today, uh, 12 months out, if somebody did a contract and a deal with each other, a buyer and a seller, they did a deal for whatever their reasons were. And the forward curve is the forward curve. Um, it's not going to say that the price of crude is going to be higher or lower in 12 months time. It's just in my head, two parties got together and did a transaction 12 months in the future. And that was the price they agreed on. So it, it's not very predictive in my, uh, my opinion, 12 to 24 months out. It just tells you where the market is that far out in the future where somebody wanted to do a transaction. Does that make sense? So I I was just muted. Uh, that being said, uh, what do you think is something that's most commonly misunderstood um, on the physical market side that you see 
from uh, investors or, or uh, market speculators or from just different parties that's most misunderstood um, in the physical movement crude? Well, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, as you make this transition, um, I think, you know, if you see these different curves and the shapes and you can see these things, they can help tell you the story about what's going on in the market. Uh, when I say the market, I'm talking about the physical market. And those can help with your investment decisions on the various companies that you're investing in. You know, if you're, you know, uh, investing in and, and, and getting larger in positions where you start to see a whole bunch of contango WTI and contango basis, uh, that meaning that, you know, crude's going into storage or there's something happening. Um, is that really the right thing to be doing? Question mark. I don't know. Um, and so it's just, I just think there's opportunities to look within the physical markets and how they trade. And that can help uh, with your investment decisions that you have. So, you know, I know we've talked a lot about in the com and the spaces that we've had about the investment thesis of a, you know, relatively short supply market. Well, embedded in that, you know, thesis is, an expectation that you should see a backward dated curve on the benchmarks, the WTI and the De Brent curves should be backward dated. If you're in a short uh, market, um, the combination of the WTI backwardation and, and hopefully uh, backward basis differentials should, you know, um, align with your, you know, your thesis. And if you start to see that break down, then you have to ask yourself, well, maybe my thesis is it incorrect now. You can still have a situation where, and we experienced this, you know, three weeks ago, two, three, two, three weeks ago, where, you know, the WTI uh, and Brent crudes, uh, they moved down significantly in price uh, over $10. And, and there was a, you know, massive flow event that occurred during the, the bank issues of last month. And, and there were some uh, parties on the um, commitment to trade side and then the flow side that can move the, the big marker grades, WTI and Brent, because they are a financial instrument. And so they can move, uh, even though their shape might have still been backward dated, they move, they, they move $10. And uh, it wasn't because you were in a, in a greater or less supply deficit. It just was you had a flow event. Uh, and that, that can move the price of crude very uh, substantially, as we all saw. So, Joe, we, we hear a couple of times um, different people may say, um, this is just a disconnection between the physical market and the supply market. Um, and then, you know, for some people, it's just, okay, so you, you're just looking for different reasons to, um, to just be excited about something. The price is the price. Could you talk about maybe different points in time historically or anything, if you can remember, where there was a bifurcation, um, where the, the, the financial price dictated either a higher to ambitious or too pessimistic view of the physical and uh, it, it corrected as a result of uh, the physical market? Or do, do you recall at any point in time where there was such a significant bifurcation versus where people perceive the mm. physical versus where the financial is? Well, um, obviously, if you have transactions occurring on the Brent and WTI market, they're, they're actual transactions. So clearly, um, with a buyer and seller, that is the price that they're willing to do deals at. Um, but, you know, I, I was thinking back to um, the early part of shale in 2014. I think it was 2014 where the, um, the shale revolution was really starting to take off. And, and, um, and, and what was transpiring was um, I think our price of crude oil was around 90 to a hundred dollars in Brent and WTI. And, um, the market was getting very long in the early part of 2014 and and crude was being stored on cargoes and um and and ships etc and in storage so the so the grade differentials the basis differentials of crude grades were actually um providing enough incentive to overcome the um the shape of the marker grades to to provide incentive to store and we kept storing crude and then and then 
but the price of WTI and Brent stayed up, you know, stayed very high. <laughs> um, and then middle part of that year in 2014, um, I think the Chinese came in and they just took everything and, and moved it to their own SBR. And, and, um, and then we started building crude again because everything was great. You know, everything was great again in the middle part of the year, 2014. Um, and, and, you know, we weren't starting crude anymore because they took it all and, and life was good, but we started building crude again. <laughs> um, and then, um, we kept building and building. And then, then in November Thanksgiving, I believe it was 14. It could have been 16. I get my dates mixed up, but I think it was 14. So let's just say it was 14. And, and then the, uh, Saudis made the declaration on Thanksgiving of, of, uh, of that year that they were no longer going to, uh, uh, you know, um, be the one that was going to support the price of crude oil. And they just said, we're, we're going to produce all we can. And here you go market. If, uh, if U.S. shale was going to go up and to the right, and we're going to keep building crude oil like this and, and store, store, store. Um, and Saudis were the ones that were trying to protect the market and they kept, you know, curtailing their production. They said, screw that. It's not working anymore. And they just said, here you go. And then flat price or TI and Brent, we went from that $90 or a hundred dollars very quickly down to like 60, $50. <laughs> you can see it on the chart. And that was, that was because the, the world got really long crude and, uh, the Brent and TI, uh, curves went contango very quickly. And, uh, and, and, you know, that could have been a time, but the crude basis differential is doing most of the work. Uh, whereas the shape of the Brent curve and the TI curve, uh, if I recall, was relatively flat. Now, um, that that's maybe one occurrence I can think about, but, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't happen too frequently. Obviously, when we have egress problems in Western Canada, like, you know, if those days that we had um, uh, wide differentials, um, that, that's just the, the differential was doing the work in terms of providing the incentive to store that crude through the WTI or Brent uh, crudes, you know, it, it it didn't change its shape because Canada was having problems to build pipelines. It was changing its shape. You know, WTI is what TI is. Uh, it was the local grades that had to do the work um, to either, you know, shut in crude or, or price such that uh, uh, barrels were reduced. So. I was saying is I think what's interesting about that is you highlighted a time where there was an oversupply um and the prices were still high and uh, it reminds to a point now where there seems to be uh an undersupply and prices are still low so when we talk about the participants and it's always the, the financial is always a perception of where the physical is can we talk about maybe the makeup of the individuals that participate in the financial market and how um their ability to be able to or their level of optimism of where um the, the market could be headed, could be hindered uh, as a byproduct of either um, some of the larger macro themes that are taking place or maybe some noisy signals, right? So if there's too much things going on, SPR release, or maybe there is um, this type of ship tracking that's taking place and um, there's so much going on that it's tough for them to understand, then it affects the pricing. Yeah. So the financial market, like... Um... You know the the participants of uh, the producer or the refiner are are active participants in the in the uh, in the futures contract and the curves because uh, they may be hedging their barrels. You know you've heard about producers hedging. Obviously, refiners would do the same thing. Uh, airlines would be involved at times buying jet fuel contracts because so that's a hedge for them as they're worried about prices going higher. Uh, on the trade side of the business, you have your CTA trend followers who are all participants in the game. Uh, your hedge funds, uh, probably your biggest. Um, there, there are others that would, you know, that would play in the financial instrument. Um, WTI and crude oil Brent are very good instruments uh, as a hedge against inflation. And so you'll get a lot of participants that will buy crude oil futures as a inflation hedge when when they have a point of view that um, inflation was going to go uh, higher. So. You know, there are just so many different participants that can get involved in the in the financial space and you know like the one i talked about uh, earlier where it appeared um that there was a lot of short interest on on us um uh, bonds um 
a few weeks ago and, and those guys had to cover they also apparently had a you know and uh the offsetting position was a um long oil trade so they were short the bonds long the oil and when that unwound they had to um buy back the bonds and sell their oil and that kind of led to that very quick movement of 10 12 dollars on the nymex and brent crude so um yeah, it can happen very quickly, obviously, and, and but there are many, many participants that uh, to get involved in that. Um, one of the things that I do a lot uh, is look at the commitment of trade report, um, try to see how people are positioned, see how those uh, participants are positioned, and and if they're super long or super short, it just 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 being mindful of of positioning and 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 what that could do to the market. And I think going into that um that issue no that that time frame the brent contract if i recall correctly was uh was sitting at some of its largest uh l length positions that it has ever had um and ever is a, a long term a long time but it, it was a very large brent long position and so of course when that unwound um it took prices down pretty quickly And Joe, when you look at that, when you say, okay, um, um, there's too many people that are long, um, but you do have at the same time structural undersupply, you believe that that's the case. Um, but then you're like, oh, there's too many people that are long, so maybe these guys may unwind their position. Could you talk about that dynamic where uh, how could you use that to help you out when where at the same time you believe there's an under a structural undersupply in this market then you would expect people to be long for a longer period of time at least you know three to four year time time period but at the same time when people get long there is this type of um concern that you know what goes up must come down type of thing yeah i i do it for the purpose of being aware um you know obviously um you know, prices in in this you know the thesis of the crude oil market being undersupplied, demand not changing um backward dated shape would be your expectation number one and and yes you would expect to see length in that market um but when that length is like uh based on itself uh some of the all-time high you just have to know that that's the case and you have to know that hey look the thing things can go uh, if those people were tapped on a shoulder and needed to leave and exit their position, and that's what happened, that, wow, okay, it can happen. And you shouldn't be surprised. And it doesn't change the, the the narrative or the thesis. It just says, okay, something, you know, they had to get out. So, yeah, it might not have been, uh, you know, unreal to see the large position, but um, the fact there was, was it, it is. So... I just when I see those things uh, and in this multi they, like that report that comes out is multi commodities. So it's just seeing which ones uh, have a whole bunch of interest in them. Uh, you just need to know. Sounds good. Uh, Joe, I think what was really illuminating is when we in the first part of the segment, when we went through the map, we talked about uh, the progression as to how um, crude was flowing when Canada was producing 1.5 million to 2 million and how as we increased and ramped up production um, you know before when we had less production it was used to be Brent uh, sorry it was WTI that would be higher than Brent because we were trying to pull barrels um, from uh, the other side of the world to North America now that uh, we've ramped production the U.S. has ramped production we're pushing barrels away so WTI is now less than Brent um, you also talked about how um, now, uh, as a result of when when oil used to come from Seaway all the way up, now it's coming all the way down. The other th big aspect is the next leg, or maybe the the potential, the future of um, uh, Canadian oil flows. When we talk about Trans Mountain mm -hmm. and the potential of that, and what it could do um, for our Canadian markets. Could we talk about uh, Trans Mountain a little bit, uh, Joe? Yeah, sure. I, so it, I, if I understand correctly, it's going to be almost 600,000 barrels a day at new pipe capacity going westbound. Um, it'll uh, enable um, a lot, much larger volume of ship activity 
um, through the Vancouver port. And, and when that, you know, when that happens, let's talk about the first part about where it goes. So, you know, um, 600,000 barrels a day. They're, the producers have signed up commitments on that pipeline, some of them. Uh, and so you're going to go put it on a boat and then you're going to send it someplace. Well, you know, I think there's a natural market down here in California. Uh, if they want our crude, I don't know if they want our crude or not. I, who knows? Um, but there used to be a pretty good heavy oil uh, deposit down here in California. Uh, that deposit has been declining over time. And so some of these refineries that are built down here were built to run heavy oil. And, and so there have been uh, crews from Colombia and, and South America that have, you know, imported in here to, to satisfy some of the refining needs. Uh, I think Canadian crude oil off the dock at Burnaby would be a perfect uh, fit for some of these grades in, in this market here. Um, but I, I still do think incrementally um, this barrel that comes down TMX will go on a boat and go to Asia. And, uh, and that, that'll be a good thing because it'll um, enhance the marketing or markets that uh, Canadian crude goes to. And, and that'll be good. The only question that I don't know is who's going to pay for that freight <laughs> because um, the refiner who's over in Asia, he already has alternatives. So he's not going to buy that crude off of Burnaby at, uh, at the producer's alternative. He's going to buy it at his alternative. And so I think at the end of the day, I think the producers are going to have to eat that three or four dollar freight rate, whatever that happens to be. So said another way is, yeah, um, you know, you have we've talked about pricing being Gulf Coast less transportation. Well, in the case of the barrels that come down that Trans Mountain system and go over to Asia, it's it'll it'll be Asia some number less some transportation back to uh, back to Edmonton, I think is how that's going to work. But I don't know. Um, that's a wait and see. Now, the implication, though, um, to your other question, is so we if we pull away 600,000 barrels, uh, then this line starts, that's a pretty big deal because where's that 600,000 barrels going to come from? Yeah, uh, so if we're all, if we're moving one day, all the crew is coming down these uh, trunks, trunk line systems that I've talked about, and then next day this one opens up for 600, well, that means there has to be 600 less on this system. So, so what ends up happening? Um, I think what ends up happening is that there's less crude probably going this, this down into here or over to here. Um, and particularly, there's going to be less crude to those who have alternatives. Um, what I think ends up happening is you'll um, see these guys start to buy more barrels from other sources because the crude that was on that line coming down is no longer going to be there. Uh, and so I think that's that's going to um, mean that they're going to look for alternate sources. And um, and I also think it's going to make the WCS differential back at Edmonton and Hardesty much stronger. Obviously, when these guys are um, needing the crude, they're going to try to bid some of it up. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. The, the second shoe to drop in that whole thing, though, is it really gives the incentive for the producers to get at it again and start bringing more oil to the marketplace. You know, I was really surprised last year. Um, I think we started line three, October, November of 2021. And, and, um, and then I think what happened is in November of 21, we drained all our Western Canadian tanks because we added essentially 300 a day, a new pipeline capacity on line three replacement and the market drained all this crude from our tanks and all that crude ended up in the Gulf coast. Uh, and then that's right around the time frame where we started hearing about, um, certain Canadian crude oils being exported to Asia off the Gulf coast, blah, blah, blah. Well, that was happening because we drained our tanks. Um, but what was interesting is, uh, our producers did a whole bunch of maintenance, which they normally do in April timeframe. And our tanks were right near tank bottoms, uh, in May of 2022. But what was so interesting to me is that from May of 22 to the end of the year, we almost filled our tanks again. Now, of course, I look at pre Keystone pipe spill because they had a pipe spill right around this location here uh, on this side, I think it was. Um, but yeah, so they had that um, they had that spill and so we started to build tanks uh, or in inventories really quickly. 
But my point is just prior to the spill, we were building inventories again in Western Canada. What does, what does that mean? That means the Western Canadian producers added over 300,000 barrels a day of production. Um, and I say that silently because I think no one actually <laughs> uh, because everyone was like, oh, okay, well, it'd be great to get new capacity. But the reality is we filled that pipeline in one year. Now, I don't think TMX, when it starts, we're going to fill that 600 in one year. That's just not going to happen. But what will happen is um, there's the brownfield expansions and there's some greenfield things that will start going ahead, projects, et cetera. And those will get uh, a lot more attention uh, when you actually have Trans Mountain online and uh, the ability to start to feed that feed because uh, that egress is going to be there. And you're going to have a very tight differential. That differential is going to incent uh, producers to do something um, and and take advantage of their resource base that they have. And then speaking of uh, a tight differential, like what what can we expect? Because uh, I think what's interesting is all the refineries that have grown accustomed to this heavy oil um, are accustomed to it. And when you open up the other pipeline, now you you get them to compete with Asian markets. So now they're willing to pay up maybe a little bit more, but there is a point where they wouldn't um, go beyond that because it becomes less uh, uh, competitive for them. Uh, to yeah. so could we talk about maybe what is like a sweet spot where we can uh, anticipate uh, with more with more egress, such as uh, in TMX? Uh, well, I, the thing about the refiner, and I mentioned him with the Asian the Asian refinery, is that he always has an alternative, right? And 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 so. Even the guys that are down here, they do have alternatives and, and there are medium sour grades that are on the Gulf Coast and, and whatnot. So so there are, what, three and a half million barrels a day that get exported out of the Gulf Coast. Now, typically those barrels are of light, sweet variety, as we understand. Um, so those crude grades, you know, are, are um, not ideally suited for these refineries that are big, heavy crude guys. Um, but... Um, so if, if, if you do have, you know, the, the WCS barrels that got pulled away, uh, these guys here will be looking for next best alternatives and they'll be scouring, you know, the globe for those. And who knows, maybe Mexico, some of the Venezuelan, maybe even some of the OPEC barrels, they, they start bidding those barrels up. So what does that mean for WCS on the Gulf Coast? Um, you know, it, I think it's, you know, going to get a little bit stronger. Um because you're just going to have that lack of crude that's coming down. Um, and so that's going to make the barrels that do get down there will be stronger. Uh, these guys are looking for uh, alternatives to import in to fill their refinery needs. So that's going to help set that price for where that WCS barrel goes. And then, as I said, Canadian crudes price off a of Gulf Coast. So it's going to be Gulf Coast less some transportation. Well, you know, that whole transportation piece that might be six, five, six, seven dollar delta from where your Gulf Coast prices are, right? Whereas if things are pipes pipes are full, you're, you know, seven to ten dollar range. So so you're gonna have some savings or not savings. There's there's going to be the way a Canadian barrels price up here, it's going to be stronger uh, just on the transportation side. Because I think there's less going that way. And then down on the Gulf Coast, it has a chance to be stronger just because there's lack lack of sour crude down there and there's gonna be some getting imported in. So we know it's about between 10 to 15 dollars to move a barrel to move crude by rail. You did mention it's about five to six dollars to move it from Alberta all the way down to the Gulf Coast. Uh, is that included in the differential uh, the five to six dollars of tra transportation cost? Well, here's how I think about it. So, um, if all the pipelines are full and you're going full, you know, told to get crude to the Gulf Coast, it's around $10. Well, it's just round number, 10 bucks. Um, and then, you know, if you go by rail, it's $13, $15 or whatever the number is. So when we build TMX, there should not be any rail happening on Western Canada. It just, it doesn't make sense to me that you would be a, have crude on rail. Now, you might have some rail guys that are moving uh, some because they might have long-term contracts that they're unable to get out of. Um, but for the most part, when you have TMX online, I think our rail should just go to like zero. Um, now, the way to think about the whole pipeline and the Gulf Coast thing, this is the way I think about it. Um, 
I think about two segments, uh, Western Canada to Cushing and then Cushing to the Gulf Coast. And, and so this segment here from Western Canada to Cushing should be six, $7 type numbers. And then here to here, uh, should be, um, three to $4. But what has happened over time is the, um, there's more pipe capacities leaving Cushing, going to the Gulf Coast than there is crude. And, and that's a function of a couple things. Um, the folks out in the um, uh, Permian uh, area built a whole bunch of pipe capacity down into uh, Corpus and they built it into the Gulf Coast. And so those barrels prior to would go up this basin pipeline into Cushing and then down. And so the, the pipelines that the, were built in the Permian um, for lack of better words, um, they found a better route to the end market and therefore they're not going up to the Cushing. And so when, you know, the Seaway and Seaway Twin and the market link got built, um, there was sufficient capacity. So this pipe, you know, this segment, so again, back to two segments, this segment I think is moving for 50 cents to a dollar on, on tariff. And then you got the, you know, six, $7 on this segment. And that's why you have that Delta between five, six to seven dollars on tariff from Gulf Coast to to Hardesty. Is that okay. too, too deep? <laughs> that, it's it's great to think about it this way because um, you know, but you know, what, if you're but, buying buying your company or buying your equity, you're not going to think about that. Like that at the end of the day, you know, from this talk, think about hey, look, you know, uh, what Joe said is that WCS on the Gulf Coast is really important and if i don't know what wcs in the gulf coast is maybe i should think about understanding what that is um that that could be one thing and and so wcs in the gulf coast is impacted by a number of things spr release for example is one that we just all experienced last year in 2022 right as the us unloaded their their sour crude from their spr wcs on the gulf coast would normally would price around four or five dollars under you know under uh wti uh, went to minus seventeen dollars. <laughs> Why? Because there was too much sour crude in the or sour crude in the Gulf Coast. Um, that that was good to know. Um, global Joe, yeah. when they were selling, I mean, if, if it went to minus seventeen dollars at that at that hub, that means that um, the the government was paying the the refiners to take it. Uh, well, no, 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 because you're you're selling it at a wti less than oh, seven you're talking about minus 17 is differential got it yeah yeah just the differential yeah yeah yeah. sorry i i just at the end of the day in when you're in the business a lot you just talk about the differential the, <laughs> the wti is going to be the wti it is what it is right uh so so yeah i just i'm just naturally just say yeah the differential is 17 and so let's do the math if you're 17 in the gulf coast and your seven dollar transportation uh, up to Hardesty, well, there, that's why we were at twenty-four dollar differential. That's 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 why it happened. That we we're sitting at twenty-four bucks last year in Hardesty. And um, is there a, so when when you when uh, you see the differentials are a little bit off, and you go through your troubleshooting process to kind of see what's going on? So typically, you will look at inventory levels in Alberta to see, okay, how are they doing for for our heavy oil? Um, you look at Western. Uh, at, at that hub over there down in, in uh, Gulf Coast uh, just to see how they're doing. What are some of the other things that you're looking at to kind of suss out if, if there is, if the differential starts to really um, widen uh, as to maybe what's going on and why this is happening? Uh, well, I, I try to understand what's going on with the flows and, and it's tough, you know, you need to be in the game. I mean, in the game physically is that you're actually moving the crude to get the insights about what people are bidding, what they're offering, et cetera, seeing the flows, um, seeing the cargoes and the, and the whatnot. So those guys that are actually in the game, they have, they have the knowledge systems in place and good on them. And that's what they're investing and in, in trying to do. Uh, for me, I I'm, I'm trying to figure out, okay. Uh, I was trying to look at is resid pricing in the globe getting weaker, right? So, because at the end of the day, your heavy crude is making asphalt or resid. And so um, trying to figure out what was going on there as well as what were sour crudes doing in the rest of the globe. Now, 
there was a lot of a lot of Russian crude that you know there was two things that were impacting sour crude on the Gulf Coast at this exact same time, the SPR release, and then sour crude out of Russia was discounted on price so that the folks in in India and China you know were buying that crude cheaply. Well, that meant that um, they weren't buying other other sour crudes and and through the trickle down effect and and uh, um, other sour crudes got cheaper as well in the world. Why? Because well, they're those guys were not buying those barrels, and so they had to go find another market. And as that proceeded on, that just led to Gulf Coast getting cheaper. So it's just a couple things there. And then I will always look at the shape of the curve. I will always look at the basis differential, and I'll look at and its shape, and I'll look at the marker shape, and I'm trying to determine is crude storable or not. And for me, that's a big tell. And if if crude is storable, then you know you've got too much supply. And it could be a regional thing. It might be a macro thing. I don't know. But I'm always looking for if crude is storable. And and if you keep that mental model of why the theory of backwardation and the theory can tango, it, if, if you're in backwardated sh shape, that means that you're paying a premium for the crude supply or whatever that supply is. It doesn't need to be crude because you want to have that convenience of that of that barrel or whatever it is in your hand as opposed to the um, contango where it's like, okay, the shape is set telling you I'm oversupplied and I'm just trying to get rid of my, my problem and I'll, I'll solve it through a solution called storage. Joe, um, to wrap this up, it's been a wonderful discussion. Uh, I always learn about, uh, I always <laughs> learn so much from you uh, in regards on, on this. Well, uh, welcome. Uh, no, so, it's been good. You know, this has been wonderful. Uh, to wrap it up, uh, could we talk about maybe just the potential uh, of Canada, maybe what it could be uh, versus where we're currently at, uh, versus where we currently are. And the other thing that was highlighted in my last conversation with you is uh, the progress we've made. It, yeah, the perception may be we're not really um, making as much progress, but the reality is we went from one 1. 1.5 million barrels a day uh, we've gotten a chance uh, to ramp up uh, significantly, 3.5 million barrels, we're at 5 million barrels. You talk about how we could potentially get to 7 million barrels. Uh, could you talk about uh, sort of maybe the, the progress we've, we've been able to make so far and uh, how much more opportunity, how much the runway we've got left to go? Well, we have an amazing resource base in, in northern Alberta. Uh, we already know that. And it's you know, uh, I can't remember. There would be other folks that would be able to say whether we're number two or number three on the list in terms of reserves. Um, and and a lot of those reserves, the engineers uh, like Razor and other folks, skits have, have figured out how to produce our basin, and that that for me is is huge. And so, um, you know, and and the oil that the guys are producing today, they've made incredible strides in reducing emissions and reducing steam oil ratio, and 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 whatnot. And and we are producing, um, you know, the, our oil that we are producing is is just been fabulous in terms of water usage and whatnot. It's just been fantastic. So, you know, the resource base is there. Um, the the ability for us to to get to seven million it i would say it was there um is it could we do it the answer is yes you need to have the egress though and and that's the thing that this region of the world have always been dealing with is getting egress and you know but there was a time uh many years ago when we would sit in some of these sessions and then with xl and Energy East and with Gateway and whatnot, those are the those are the assets that could have made that could have made the difference for this base. And then, and then, I fully believe we would have filled those lines up. And uh, and I just shudder to think about the royalty missed opportunity and royalty and tax revenues that could have occurred. But uh, yeah, you know, five million is pretty amazing. To, and and you're gonna have. I would think with after TMX, then we'll probably fill that up over a number of years. And in terms of a TMX, um, I mean, we've seen the last pipeline, how quick it was filled up. Um, Trans Mountain, what are your thoughts? Like, um, would we say that we're over, we will be over piped with the Trans Mountain, or is that going to be maybe another quick one year, two year? Yeah, I, 
I think it's going to be more years. Um, so, so the reason we are able to fill that 300, the silent 300, I call it, <laughs> um, is because the producers were not fully producing the, to their capability prior to that line three replacement going on is my belief. Um, I, I just think that why, why produce your resource if you're, you know, just going to end up in a storage tank. Right. So they were, they were things were, you know, producing right size to the egress capacity. And, and then when line three started, then the, the ability for people to, or assets to, to turn up in production. And they did that was fabulous. Now, trans mountain's going to be a little bit more different because, um, the, a lot of the brownfield expansions or figuring out how to run better, um, you know, that, that got used up. And so the next tranche will be cap capex on, on other new projects. Um, I think brownfield will go, but brown brownfield will still be two, three years. You know, I shouldn't say two, three, uh, one to three years in that window. And, um, and we'll see how it goes. You know, who knows where WTI is going to go and the price of crude. Having said all that, um, it's an interesting dilemma that I think the management teams in, in Western Canada are going to go through is like, okay, can, do we want to invest or are they going to listen to what shareholders are saying in terms of buyback shares and, and dividends, et cetera. So it's a very interesting time. Um, but the, the egress will be there when TMX does, uh, does get built. And, uh, like I said, the resource space is there. They know where the oil is. They just and they know how to build SAG D and they know how to drill and they know how to do all these other technology improvements and and they can they can fill if they so choose. And we'll we'll see how it goes. So, I think in, a, so in a way, limited pipeline capacity can help accelerate shareholder returns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then, this was great. The other thing, I guess, just before we wrap up, is when production increases heavy, especially heavy oil increases someplace, you're taking someone else's market share. Um, when we increased, when we ramped up from 1.5, 2 million barrels to 5 million, who who was who affected by this? Uh, who um, mm. uh, ended up uh, getting squeezed out as uh, Canada increased its global stake? Well, yeah, I, I don't like to use the word squeeze, but as we move more crude down into the Gulf Coast and into this region and over here, um specifically down in this area on the gulf coast um the major suppliers of heavy oil were the mexican maya crude oil uh the venezuelans and some of the saudi heavies now what ended up happening with the mexican maya crude is um just from natural decline it it was almost two million barrels a day of production i believe and and it just can it just naturally climbed uh, declined and as it declined, then there was just less of it to be sold to the to the Gulf Coast. So that was a natural um, our WCS crude essentially, um, you know, backfilled the Mexican, the Venezuelans. You know, their story is pretty well documented. You know, they ended up uh, having problems with their their country, socialism, etc. And as a consequence, the production fell. And, and so there's no longer any barrels that they, that they were sending here. In fact, I think they're starting to send to China. And then the, the last one I was saying was um, there were some, you know, Iraqi and, and other uh, Saudi heavy barrels. And I just think, you know, the Saudis, I think, maintained because the U.S. is still importing six million barrels a day of crude oil, three of three and a half of which comes from Canada. So that other two and a half uh, comes from those other places um, that I talked about. And that six million used to be seven, seven and a half. And so that was the reduction that, you know, that Canada essentially uh, backfilled. Joe, we're all grateful uh, to you for doing this. Uh, we're oh, been great. I was uh, 30 minutes so far. This is absolutely. I just don't know if it. You know, I I hope it makes sense to people. Very high level. There's probably other things that we can talk about another day down the road. But uh, no, it's been good. Uh, Reminds me of the good old days. <laughs> well, it's because we always, uh, in the spaces, without the visual aids, you're always like hear about just different locations and yeah, the rattling off. But being able to kind of take the time out today and go with the map and talk about the different points and how the crude flows, where it flows, so it's going to be made available uh, to everyone else that wasn't able to attend uh, on the spaces um, uh, via video. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll tweet and, uh, and share that link out. But for the first time, uh, you've given us all the opportunity to kind of um, 
go along with uh, the, through the map and see how it flows through and where it goes and um, even a possibility to troubleshoot in the future if we have uh, um, any any sort of widening of the differential or, or anything of the sort. Um, and that's all it really comes down to, right? So yeah, this was great. Okay. Been good. Thanks, Oyer. Sure. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, keeping keeping me uh, being in my ear and saying we should do this. We should do this. This was good. <laughs> yeah. Noise. Is there any other maybe uh, things that you wanted? To, to oh, I, I I'm I'm quite bullish. I think you know our resource base up here is amazing. I think our our produ production committee or uh, producing committee or community is amazing. I think the refining community is is amazing as well. Um, I think you know everyone works to 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 get to uh maximize value for 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 society if you will and uh it's you know it was just it was so much fun i i think i was saying that uh i spent many years working for uh in the industry and and for a lot of it and i didn't didn't work a day in my life it was just i just loved it at that note, uh, take care, Joe, and maybe we can see you at uh, the next last best uh, appearance. I hope so. You can make it. We'll be we'll be there in May for sure, right? That's when the guys are coming in. That's when uh, Duff and uh, Garquake are uh, coming down. Perfect. All right. <laughs> All right. Care. Thanks, Joe. Best.